if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. <laughs> Life is like an ocean voyage, and our bodies are the ships. And without a moral compass, we would all be cast adrift. So to keep us on our bearings, the Lord gave us a gift. And like most gifts you get, it was a book. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, which seems perfectly legit and requires no further explanation, evidence, or proof that it actually happened as written. And the angel said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought to you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And the Israelites were thoroughly confused because at this point they were under the impression that Todd allegedly did all these things, not the angel of the Lord who has now taken the credit for some unknown reason. The angel continued, as I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye not done this? And the people of Israel started talking all at the same time. The Gibeonites, for example, had put on costumes that defrauded them into signing a binding contract that they would remain alive and volunteer to become perpetual slaves. Other Canaanites had chariots of iron, and even Todd, as revealed in the previous chapter, was not able to drive them out. And as far as that covenant that the angel of the Lord referred to, Todd had promised that none of the Canaanites would be able to stand before the Israelites, but for some reason they were able to do so despite Todd's promises. So assuming there was some sort of oral contract describing both the responsibilities of Todd and the Israelites following her instructions, it was very clear that Todd violated the contract first, so legally the Israelites were free and clear to do whatever the bloody hell they wanted. The angel completely ignored these statements as religious people normally react when confronted with undeniable truths, and she said, Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And before thou sayest anything else, such as the fact that this was a change to the contract after Todd had failed to live up to her in the bargain, remember that this is all thine own damn fault. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept, for they could not get this angelic bitch to understand that since Todd had failed to fulfill her requirements in the original contract, they were no longer under any other legal or moral obligation to follow her exasperating, never-changing orders. And they called the name of that place Bochum, which the very accurate King James Version does not give the uh, definition thereof. Bochum in the original Hebrew means weeping, a reflection of the fact that at this particular location, the people of Israel became so fed up with Todd's perfect, moral, righteous, and ethical degrees, which under no circumstances were ever changed for any reason at all, and absolutely everything that happened was the Israelites' fault, and Todd being an absolutely omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and omnibenevolent deity had absolutely no responsibility at all for anything that ever happened in this entire book of stupid. Now, we, before we proceed to the next verse, I feel like I must remind you that the Bible is completely accurate, non-contradictory, inspired word of Almighty Todd. I realize that I tend to repeat that phrase in almost every installment of literally Joshua and literally Judges, and thou art most certainly tired of hearing the same old line again and again and again. But I must needs repeat it again, otherwise thou mightest come to the conclusion that I am just making stuff up, and none of this crap actually appears in the Bible. Now rememberest, if thou wilt, that Joshua, the son of a nun, Moses' minister, had already died, passed on, kicked the bucket, and in the last chapter of the book of Joshua. The entire first chapter of Judges and the second chapter of verse 5 happen after his death. Now, let us proceed to verse 6. And when Joshua let the people go, having suddenly resurrected long after he was dead, the children of Israel went every man to his inheritance to possess the land. Now, this can only be true under one of two circumstances. Either this narrative is completely buggered up and written out of order, which cannot possibly be true since the Bible is completely accurate and non contradictory word of Todd, but Joshua was a zombie who rose from the grave to lead his people after they had really screwed up in the first chapter when they did not kill absolutely everything that breathed, including houseplants. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, again, having already done so in Joshua chapter 24, and all the days of the elders that had outlived Joshua, presumably the same ones that had outlived him before, and were quite concerned that Joshua would, would just keep on living and arise from the grave once again. They had seen all the great works of the Lord, what she did for Israel, the last one being that she resurrected their leader after he had died in the previous book. And Joshua, the son of Anun, Moses' minister, the servant of the Lord, died again, being 110 years old. 
and the elders of Israel that outlived him consulted the books to determine how to keep the bastard dead this time. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in ten Nasseries, or however thou sayest that, in Mount Ephraim, in the north side of the hill of Gash. But his heart, having been pierced through with a sharp wooden stake, was buried separately at an undisclosed location, and they did hope that this would keep him dead. And also all that generation were gathered to the fathers who did sell him to stop playing out in the middle of the street, and furthermore did ask him if they were finished with their homework. And there arose another generation after them who knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which she did for Israel, mostly because she did live in a creepy old house at the end of the lane, and did keep all their footballs that were thrown into her yard. And the children of Israel, and presumably the adults as well at this point, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Sir Balaam, as we all know how absolutely evil it is to exercise one's inherent right of self-expression to the point of following a religion other than the traditional beliefs of the majority of people in the given society. And they forsook the Lord taught of their fathers with still causes confusion with statisticians, complete surveys about religious beliefs, and come to the conclusion that a significant majority of people no longer follow the religious beliefs of their parents. And the parents do shake their heads at their children for not following the Lord taught of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, which they keep told themselves, even though Israeli archaeology has proven that nothing of the sort ever actually happened, and followed other gods, which in no way proved that the Bible is actually a polytheistic nature. Of the gods of the people which were around them, which any serious student of theology ought to study about, for it is a very interesting subject, I tell to see what, and bowed themselves unto them, which, once again, they have a fundamental right to do so, and provoke the Lord's anger, and every other big and intolerant fund yuckchard will follow after, who typically get angry when they meet somebody who has the audacity to follow another religion. And they forsook the Lord, that being Yahweh, a ruthless god of war, death, and destruction, and Sir Baal and Ashtaroth, Yahweh's two other counterparts in this traditional Semitic polytheistic religious belief system. Baal apparently being a god of weather and agriculture, and Ashtaroth being a goddess of fertility. Apparently, when the land rests from war, as indicated at the end of Joshua chapter 11, and again at the end of Joshua chapter 24, and again as half of that chapter is repeated here, the people want to abandon the god of war and want to follow the gods that represent peace and love. Of course, this pisses off the god of war, who causes the god to bring war, death, destruction, and slavery upon the people until they abandon the gods of peace and begin to worship the god of war. Once peace returns, they begin to worship the gods of peace once again, pissing off the god of war, and the cycle of death repeats itself over and over and over again. I'll bet the a million docus that's what's going to happen. But, mm, let's keep reading. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and she delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, which is what spoilers normally do, of course. And she sold them into the hands of the enemies round about, so they can no longer stand before the enemies, which is a bit of a laugh, as they were not able to stand before the enemies before, in direct contradiction to Todd's promise that none of their enemies would be able to stand before them. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord has said, and as the Lord has sworn unto them, having given them fair warning in one of those myriad times that she exchanged her promises throughout this 3,000 year old book of stupid. And they were greatly distressed, as is the narrator of the series, as is viewer, because this entire chapter doth read like a religious apologist given backhanded, ill conceived, and illogical excuses for the ever changing dictates of their Todd. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, is she not merciful? which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto the judges, who were vested by the same ruthless dictator who caused them to be sold into the hands of the spoilers in the first place, in a secret backdoor meeting that was most assuredly thoroughly corrupt, and millions of taxpayers' dollars did exchange hands that the lawmakers did pass laws favoring the spoilers. But they went a-whoring after other gods, presumably the aforementioned Baal and Ashtaroth, and bowed themselves unto them mostly because Baal and Ashtaroth, being gods of peace and love, were never involved in any of Yahweh's backdoor deals. They quickly turned out of the way which the fathers walked in, obeying the ever-changing commands of their lord. But they did not so, because they did their own research and remained open-minded, and decided to follow the dictates of peaceful and loving gods and goddesses rather than the insane commands of a malevolent prick. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord is with the judge, proving up absolutely everything that they did, no matter how evil, immoral, or unethical their actions were. And the Lord, actively supporting the judge, delivered them out of the hands of the enemies all the days of the judge, and the enemies did swing the Lord and say to her, So, same time next Thursday? And the Lord did tell the enemies to shut the bloody hell up, for if the Israelites ever catch on to the corruption after the transcript is published on Wikileaks, 
then the deal will be off. For it repented the Lord. For though she is an omniscient Todd who never changes her mind, it does change her mind quite often because of their groaning by reason of them that oppress them and vex them, make a good show of it, pretend that they did not actually know who was pulling the purse strings of this particular operation. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, shot in the back by an unidentified vast man, who, which surprised absolutely no one, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers, although at no time more corrupt than taught herself, who was busy orchestrating the whole bloody exercise. They followed other gods to serve them, to bow down before them, innocently exercising their inherent right of religious liberty. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way, and damn right they did not, for they never really needed to. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and so were all of the religious bigots who were pissed off that they could not control other people's private lives. And she said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, even though I violated the contract first, and they were no longer expected to follow my orders, therefore they have not hunkered unto my voice, which surprises no one at this point. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, either time, assuming, of course, that my trash record spot was up to this point. That through them I might prove Israel. Yeah, mm, that's it. I purposely failed at my end of the covenant for a reason. But because I'm actually a weak and ineffective deity who constantly fails my followers, breaks my promises, and ignored the cries of the desperate and needy, concentrate my efforts on fixing football games. I want to know, in this case, whether the Israelites will keep the way of the Lord, which is me, presumably, as it seems that the author of this book of stupid has forgotten that I am still in dialogue. To walk therein and ask the fathers to keep it, nor not, for we know that their fathers did no such thing. Quote, quote. Therefore, the Lord left those nations on purpose, having thus broken her own bloody promises, again, without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered she them into the hand of Joshua, for despite having died a second time, having been buried a second time, his heart having been buried separately with a wooden stake shoved through it. He did resurrect a second damn time, and did walk around all zombified and stuff, and did scare the teenagers sitting with their girlfriends on the backs of the donkeys, looking at the stars that make out point. And they did censor and said unto zombie Joshua, Oh my god, a zombie! Go to, let us get the flock out of here! Yeehaw, swing your daughter by the hand, but if she gets raped by a man and refuses then to marry him, stone her to death! 